go. Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the GLAC Research Roundup, summarizing Great Lakes aquaculture research findings. My name is Nicole Wright, Ohio Sea Grant's aquaculture specialist. Ohio Sea Grant is one of 34 programs located in coastal and Great Lakes states, each a federal university partnership. This webinar is presented by the Great Lakes Aquaculture Collaborative. We are a network of eight Great Lakes Sea Grant programs working towards providing science-based information and activities that support an environmentally responsible, competitive, and sustainable aquaculture industry in the Great Lakes region. As a collaborative, our work in research, education, and outreach to meet our goal is guided by state and regional advisory groups made up of industry, academic and regulatory members. Please visit our website seen here to find more details. Today, you can use the chat throughout the meeting to ask questions or make comments for the greater good. We'll use the last 10 minutes of the hour for this Q&A. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Ohio Sea Grant YouTube page and accessible through the GLAC website. Um, finally, before we get started, I want to introduce you to the Great Lakes Fresh Fish Finder, um, a web platform built to connect consumers and fish producers and harvesters in the Great Lakes region. Each business has a web page where you can learn about what they're selling, where they're selling it, how they're selling it, and um, their, their business profile. Today, we have three speakers speaking on a number of research topics. To get us started, we'll have Stuart Carlton, and then we'll hand it off to Trey Malone and Max Nelstrom. So Stuart, I will hand it over to you now. Great, thanks for that. Let me uh, hit the button and hopefully we'll start sharing. I'll have to do this find the right thing. Okay, this uh, should be right. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for joining in. So I'm going to be talking about barriers to growth among aquaculture producers in the Midwest. And this is work that I did with Haley Hartenstein, who is a uh, master's student. She did the grunt work. I get to come in and take the glory during the big uh, presentation, which is always the, the funnest part. And uh, But I want to acknowledge all the hard work that, that she did. And while I'm busy acknowledging stuff, if you're going to acknowledge... Uh, you might as well have logos and thanks and stuff like that. So there are the logos, there are the thanks. Um, my lab group is called the Coastal and Great Lakes Social Science Lab, and that's part of the work that I do at Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, who is my uh, my primary employer at Purdue University. And this project was funded by the Great Lakes Aquaculture Collaborative Work, which is funded by NOAA and National Sea Grant. And also part of it was funded by the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center, NICRAC, um, who've been very great partners to, to us and uh, many people throughout the, the region. Uh, right, let's see. So let me start by setting expectations. Now, the thing is, is that um, I, I can't sit there and listen to myself talk for like 20 minutes uninterrupted. And I imagine you can't do the same either. If you can, um, then bully for you. But, but uh, so what I'm going to do is I, I will take some breaks. Now, I think your audio is turned off, um, but, but I'll probably ask for some items in the chat. And so I, I'm, uh, there's going to be a time or two where I'm going to ask you to spit some stuff into the chat to try to be a little bit interactive because um, listening to me yammer on is nobody's idea of a good time, including my own. Uh, so I just wanted to set that expectation going forward so that we're all on the same page. Oh, yeah, I, I even set up this whole thing. I'm not going to be yelling through a megaphone too much. There'll be a little bit of that. Um, but sometimes the little red line and slash will come in and burn up the megaphone, and I'll, I'll ask you for some input. Because uh, it's better for having a dialogue, right? Look how happy these kids are. They're talking to each other. Uh, it's, it's a two-way street. So that's good. So I'm going to start by talking about aquaculture, the Midwest and, and the U.S. North Central region. So the U.S., first of all, consumes a lot of seafood. It's a common idea that the U.S. doesn't consume a lot of seafood, but they do. It's second globally behind only China. So that's quite a lot um, uh, of seafood. But a lot of this is imported, right? Uh, imported wild-caught seafood, imported um, farm seafood potentially as well. And, and um, so, in fact, it, it, so much is important that we have a really significant trade deficit. Let me grow this graph up just a little bit so you can see it. This is our U.S. seafood trade 
deficit. And on the y axis, if you can see that, we have the import to export ratio. So numbers above one mean that we're exporting or we're importing, excuse me, more than we're exporting. Numbers that are uh, below one, which are not featured on this graph, means that we're uh, importing or that we're exporting, uh, pardon me, we're importing more, less than we're exporting. So we're a net exporter. So we are a net importer of seafood by quite a lot. The green line is in dollar value and the, the purple line is in weight. And, and it's only been increasing in recent years. Now, this is all pre-COVID. I'd be interested in knowing how that changed with COVID, if it has at all. But the trade deficit is actually growing. So this is why um, this is an interesting issue. And that's for all edible seafood. But one idea that is out there is maybe we can use our aquaculture to try to uh, change this trade deficit, try to you know have more locally or, or uh, food grown in the United States and have it done in a way that's really sustainable. Is aquaculture the solution for that? And more specifically, um, aquaculture in this region, right? <laughs> um, in the Midwest. Now the focus of the Great Lakes Aquaculture Collaborative is those Great Lakes states where they have sea grant programs, right? Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana. Uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota, uh, and then over on the other side, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, um, Vermont, even though they're not right on a, a great lake, they're on a very good lake in Lake Champlain. And um, so that's been a lot of the focus. I don't think I forgot anybody. If I forgot your Sea Grant program, um, I apologize. And the reason it's such an interesting area is we got 22% of the population, right? If you look at the orange slice of that pie on the left in the Midwest, but we have a third of the farms. So there's a lot of the farms, right? And we have a third of the farms in the US but on top of that, we have uh, only 16% of the food fish farms. So aquaculture is not uh, a big part of that, or we're underrepresented in aquaculture, I would say, relative to the amount of farmland. And a lot of that is because of shellfish aquaculture in the coastal areas. But still, we're not pulling our weight in the Midwest nationally um, when you think about the number of farms we have versus the number of food fish farms we have. But then even worse, uh, look at sales. We have 16% of the food fish farms, but only about 1%, 1.5% 1 of the food fish sales. So we're really not pulling our weight there, right? There's this huge gap between the farming culture in this area and the fish farming, um, or not so much culture, the farming industry in this area, and then the, specifically the fish farming industry in this area, which is smaller um, than we would expect and, and uh, a smaller portion of the sales we would expect. So looking at all these together, you can see those orange slices, right? We got a 22% of the population, but a third of the farms, but only 16% of the food fish farms and only 1% of the sales. Uh, so this idea that like, um, oh, and then it's reflected when you look at the data too, right? So this is a graph uh, showing the food fish farms over time. And it's been shrinking or really steady to shrinking throughout the Midwest. This is the US, uh, yeah, this is the North, uh, the USDA North Central region. Um, and it doesn't include the Great Lakes, the other Great Lakes states, but it's the same. And uh, you look at it, we can go it up and it's pretty much flat to down in almost every state since 2000. Um, and so that is suboptimal. And then same thing with sales. If you look at sales, right? Sales are, uh, these are in constant 2018 dollars, uh, thousands of dollars. Uh, we don't have any data for North Dakota because they didn't report it. This is from the USDA census of um, aquaculture, which Amy Schambach, who works for us, tells me is not the uh, perfect source of data, but it's, um, it's the best source of data we have on this stuff. Uh, and so um, we have no data for North Dakota and minimal for South Dakota. But you know, it's been flat, uh, maybe up a little bit in a few states, but this is not a booming market, right? And uh, Max or Trey can tell you uh, that I maybe didn't make all these adjustments right, so that's fine. But the, we're trying to go for what's broadly true. So this idea of Midwest aquaculture is the solution to our trade deficit for filling all our needs related to seafood, um, that also gets one of these little circles inside. It's just not been happening. Uh, for a number of reasons, we think, and and uh, but we wanted to really delve into that and ask why. Why is that not happening? And we wanted to focus on a specific um, question within there, right? Because when you're doing research, you take a big question and you break it down into subsequently smaller questions. And so we wanted to know why are or are not producers in this area expanding their business? And so we thought we'd ask them, right? And so we went back and asked producers. Now the producers we talked to were in the Great Lakes states. Um, uh, about this. But before I get into the details, I want to get into the theory a little bit. All right, and this is the first time I'm going to ask you for just a little bit of information. If you could tell me in the chat box, 
Um, you, give me one of three answers. Are you, uh, well, are you a producer? Are you a researcher? Or are you something else? Describe your relationship to aquaculture in like a word. If you could do that in the chat box, that would be great. If I were more organized, I of course could have set up uh, uh, one of those little online polls, but I'm, that's not the level of organization I have. So I'm seeing project managers, extension, communicators, outreach. Yes, thank you everybody. Research, more extension. Amy Schrank, hello. Uh, insurance government agency. Ooh, we have something to say about that in a little while, Benjamin. Uh, lots of researchers there. Okay, thank you, those who have responded. There's a producer. Hi, Bill, a consultant. Thank you, Fritz. Okay, uh, fantastic. I'm loving seeing all this coming through and it's helping me get a guide for who the audience is. All right, fantastic. Um, so, all right, let's go into the theoretical background. So what I'm not seeing is a lot of people who are social science researchers. So I, I will go into a little more detail here. Um, we're gonna talk about the theory of planned behavior. And uh, what this is, is a, a really classic social science theory on why people behave the way they do. This is one that's just been used a ton, a lot in health, but a lot in natural resources and things like that too. Um, it's not super cutting edge, but it's really steady and been really well tested. Um, but first, I will make a dated reference to a television show that uh, predates probably many of your lives and say, now it's time for something completely different. And the different thing is this, I want a two, two minute activity. Um, if that, I want you to think to yourself, why are you attending this webinar? I would like to know the answer. Uh, take a second and jot it down. Think through one or two reasons. Um, and, then, and then after you've written it on your piece of paper, which I'm going to do too, go ahead and paste it in the chat. Go ahead and paste it in the chat. Thank you, Don is wondering what I'm doing. I hear that, Don. All right, Jose from NOAA is uh, NIMS actually attending for knowledge. Geneva wants to improve our outreach. Wants to know about aquaculture. Fantastic. Research results. I'm going to the industry. So a lot of people are coming because they think they're gonna gain something from it, right? Um, that's what I'm hearing. Keep up on aquaculture information. Why do you wanna do that, Lindsay? Why do you wanna keep up on aquaculture information? Um, you don't have to answer, but I'm guessing the reason is because it helps you in your business or it's something you feel like you should do. Somebody wants to learn about what's being done elsewhere. This is great. I'm loving to see this. Uh, understand the current landscape. Great. All this is good. And I'll throw a couple of reasons that I have for why I'm doing this too. It's a passion. Perfect. <laughs> we love people who are passionate. Uh, the reason I'm, I tell you the number one, not even joking, the reason I'm doing this is because Nicole asked me to do it, right? She said, Stuart, can you? And sure, absolutely. Um, I also think as a researcher, I think it's important to share our research. I think that the research is best when used, right? Or at least the research I do. I think that, you know, sort of groundwork type research or theoretical research is important, but the type of work I do is best when used. So I'm hearing a lot of different reasons related to people thinking they're going to get something good out of it. Me, I'm trying to fulfill an obligation. So all of these are different reasons why you might choose to do something. So now let's go in. Yep, I just did that. Okay, great. Um, now let's go back to the theory of planned behavior. And I want you to think about the different reasons and then think about maybe some reasons that you didn't mention that might fit into this model. So I'm gonna show you the model here, but that's too small, so let's get it big. And we're gonna take it uh, one bit at a time. So we're gonna start with the behavior, All right? This is what we're talking about is a behavior. Um, and now we can't usually, when we're surveying people, we don't actually tend to ask, uh, we can't survey them about their behaviors. We can survey them about the behaviors that they intend to do, right? So when we, or when we do an interview or something like that. So we ask people about their behavioral intention. Do you intend to do this behavior or that behavior? Um, and so for example, uh, when Nicole asked me if I was gonna be on this webinar, uh, I said, yeah, I intend to be on that webinar, right? And there are a few reasons why I might intend to be at, present at the webinar. Um, and those are broken down here. And the first one, whoops, go back, Stuart. All right, um, the first one is this, attitudes towards the behavior. Uh, my attitude is, is that that's, uh, you know, I perceive that if I do this behavior, if I, if I present on the webinar, it'll be good for me. I'll enjoy doing it because I love talking to people. Um, I think that it is uh, good to share your research. I think that other people will learn from this. I think it will make a difference in the, um, in the, in the market, right? Is that getting this info out there is important. 
Um, but there's also subjective norms. We'll just group those. And that is, um, I think the researchers should share their research. That's what other people tell you they should do, right? I think it's something that you should do. I'm part of this team. My team members expect me to do it. And then perceived behavioral control is the idea of like, do you have any control over that behavior? And I feel like I can. I know how to present research. I know what the results are, even though Haley did a lot of the work. And so I feel like I have a high level of perceived behavioral control. And then all these other things on the left are antecedents to all of that, but we're not going to get into that uh, because that's too nerdy for what we're doing right now. All right. So here's our goal. Thinking about the theory of planned behavior, we want to identify barriers to growth based on this theory um, in the Great Lakes from the perspectives of the producers. And so what we did was we interviewed them, right? This is qualitative research. Um, and so what we did is this is not, we're not trying to generalize, although we spoke to a good chunk of the producers in some of these states, you could generalize, but we're trying to hear their story. That's the point of this research is trying to understand people's stories. Uh, so that's what we did. All right, so we did, uh, I actually haven't added this up yet, 5, 10, 15 plus uh, 16 is 34, 34 interviews um, in these Great Lakes states. So it's not the NICRAC region, but this is the GLAC region. And um, in some of these states, these are all the people who could get to talk to us. We had a lot of trouble in Pennsylvania. Sean, who was on the call, I think, did a nice job of connecting those folks. But some of these industries are very, very small. And um, we interviewed them. This was during uh, COVID, so we did it virtually, which means we saved some travel money, so that was cool. Uh, Zoom or a phone call, half hour to an hour. We recorded them, we anonymized them, and stored them securely. And the reason I'm mentioning all this is this was covered by the IRB. And research ethics are really important, and we follow uh, best practices for that. We're going to take these one at a time. Right. Um, we're going to talk about attitudes, uh, then norms, and then be perceived behavioral control. So as a reminder, what are attitudes? Uh, attitudes can be favorable or unfavorable, right, towards something. So we ask people about their attitudes towards expanding their business. Is that something they favor doing? Is that something they don't favor doing? Um, your attitudes are, you know, your perceptions about what's true. Is expanding business easy or hard? Why? That sort of stuff. And your attitudes are based on the information you have, your knowledge, your emotions, your beliefs, your values, that kind of stuff, all feeds into your attitudes towards something. So I grouped everybody into two groups, those who are generally in favor of expanding their business, I'm calling those business expanders, and then hesitators are those who are generally not in favor of its expanding their businesses. So when we talk to uh, expanders, generally speaking, um, they thought that one of the things that attitudes they have, aquaculture is environmentally sustainable, it's a local food, Industry expansion is good for the environment. Um, another set of things I believed, or well, and then I have some quotes too. I see it as being an opportunity to do sustainable farming and feed a lot of people, right? So these are the attitudes they expressed, people who are expanding their businesses towards aquaculture. Well, I already plan on expanding. I just look at the size of the market and there's a huge demand for fish. That's another thing they felt was the market was there. They had a positive attitude about the opportunity to expand and what it would result in. That's notably uh, different from the hesitator's attitude towards expansion, um, which we found right here is uh, things like the business is high risk, right? People who are more hesitant to expand really focus on a business being high risk and capital intensive. Profit margins are often very low and expansion risk just isn't worth it, right? Plus it's a lot of work. Nobody thinks growing fish is easy, or they do, but then they get into the business, uh, I think is maybe how it actually goes, right? And so some quotes that kind of summarize that. Uh, one producer said, no, there's a lot of risk involved, and a lot of people are not going to wait to want to take those kind of risks that we take, or they're not going to have the financial resources um, that they want to put at risk. It's an extremely expensive profession to just start from scratch, I would think. So you'd have to have money to get into it. Um, that's somebody who was talking about how nobody else would want to... Uh, or how other people would not want to expand their business. So next we're going to talk about norms. And what are norms? So we're grouping subjective or injunctive and descriptive norms. If you want to talk about those later, we can, that's fine. Um, but essentially norms are social pressures, right? Um, uh, uh, do your peers think this is something you should do or not do, right? Um, it, is there social pressure on you and social acceptance of you doing some sort of behavior, in this case, expanding your business? And uh, the good news is norms towards expansion were almost uniformly positive across the board. Um, you know, uh, these were the main kind of thoughts. The growth of the industry benefits everybody here. Peers want them to succeed or grow. It's not a super competitive industry, at least in the Midwest. And, uh, you know, it's relatively small, right? So people felt these, and so they felt like there'd be a lot of support for expanding. So that is not a notable barrier to expansion, right? Um, and, you know, here's some quotes that kind of summarize that. In the Midwest Great Lakes region, we're still, for the most part, a niche market. 
I mean, we're not a commodity where it gets cutthroat, plenty of room for everybody here. And oh yeah, I'm supportive of other people expanding as long as they got a good business plan and they got their head on thinking right. Um, so nobody wants to see people fail, I suppose, is what that farmer was getting at. Okay, and that was sort of descriptive of what was there. And perceived behavioral control is the last item of this model that we looked at. And so what is that? Again, that's your perception about uh, your ability to perform the behavior. Do you have the knowledge it takes to expand? Do you have the capitals? Are you gonna be able to surmount the challenges? Is that something you feel like you can do? Are there external barriers that are preventing you? Um, that's, that's kind of what perceived behavioral control is. And sometimes actual control comes into play, right? If you can't get financing, for example, um, for one of a bunch of reasons, uh, then that's, you know, you actually have no control over that. Your perceptions don't matter. But with perceived behavioral control, a lot of times perceptions are what's key. It's like, what do you think? The truth doesn't necessarily matter. It's what you perceive. Um, and I think there's some interesting differences. What are expanders' perceptions of perceived behavioral control? Uh, people who are expanding talked about how information is readily available. The regulations that they felt were fair, you know, maybe not necessarily easy, but were fair, and that the markets were ready for them. So they felt like there was a place for them to grow and the ability for them to grow. And we can sum that up in a quote or two. Oh, these are getting longer. Um, right now, there's a wealth of information that you can watch and take with a grain of salt. Most of the aquaculture information is good, not like some of the other crap on the internet. Uh, we all know about that, don't we? The aquaculture information is good, particularly for aquaponics. So you can spend whole evenings watching videos on various aspects of aquaculture and learn from them. Every new person getting into aquaculture should be talking to Extension. I think we all agree with that. And they should also be talking to other farmers who are willing to talk, who've been there. And uh, so I think that's, you know, really strong evidence of, of perceived behavioral control. This is something that they're able to do. What about hesitators? Hesitators tended to feel something a little bit different. They felt like financing was a challenge. Regulations were a challenge. Uh, they felt about a lack of social license, which you hear discussed a lot in aquaculture markets. We felt like those were a challenge. Uh, weak support systems um, were also a challenge. And I, I pulled out a few quotes here because I think this is really important overall. Another long one. Um, if you're a row crop farmer and you walk into farm credit, or you walked into my local small town farm banks and you tell them you farm 80 acres, they'll pretty much close their eyes, hit the calculator a few times and say, all right, this is what I'm willing to loan you to put out your crop. And you walk in there, you say, okay, I wanna raise fish and I need $100,000 for expansion of the fish farm. And they basically look at you and say, well, how much land do you own? How many cars do you have? And do you have $200,000 to pay back $100,000? That's the difference. So unequivocally, hands down, it's funding that's going to hold this thing back. So what they're saying essentially is that you have to borrow against different assets, right, in order to get a business loan for aquaculture. Um, it's not as supported. This one's even longer, but I, I think it's worth going through because uh, it touches on this idea of support systems. It's really tough to insure in aquaculture, you know, the, well, the fish anyway. You can insure liability in your building and things like that. But, you know, if a blizzard goes through Montana on a big farm cattle operation and they lose 200 head of cattle due to a blizzard, there are programs to offset those losses. In our state, if somebody loses a bunch of fish, there are no programs, you eat the loss. So there's no federal safety net, I guess. And I'm not a big fan of safety nets in general, but there's no safety net for fish health, it's high risk. You better know what you're doing. There are federal programs that can help you with other things, but nothing in terms of covering fish like with other proteins, Certain nothing, certainly nothing like with corn and soybean farmers. You know they have all kinds of programs. Oh, I, what did I do? I stopped sharing my screen, sorry about that. Let me go back to it. And we're back. All right. Um, and then social license, briefly. I think there's been a very conscientious and intentional effort by some to demarket domestic aquaculture products and demonize domestic aquaculture production. And so it's not just consumer perception, it's societal perception. And for time, I will sort of zip by that one. So what conclusions can we draw from this, right? The first is, is that, you know, attitudes, aquaculture is a high risk, high, uh, high capital, high risk business. And um, some people really perceive that. And when they feel that, uh, dramatically is when they uh, are less likely to succeed. Um, let's see, I got a chat message. What was it? Oh, yes, you can add your questions to the chat, says Nicole. So I will chime in and say that. Um, government support, funding and support is less than with traditional agriculture. And this is a problem for people who are um, perceived or who are less likely to want to expand, right? The hesitators, uh, they perceive less government funding, less government support. 
And then on top of that, farmers typically want to expand, but don't see themselves as able to. Most people have pretty favorable ideas about the concept of expansion, where their attitudes go bad um, or where their behavioral intentions tend to shy away from that is when they don't perceive the market there, they don't perceive they have the ability to expand because of the market, or they don't perceive they have the ability to expand because of the presence of capital, social safety systems, and sort of societal, societal acceptance, excuse me. So I actually can come up with a couple of recommendations there, and this will be what I close on. Um, but before I do, I'm going to read another quote to, to caveat my recommendations, right? And this is one that, uh, this is the best quote from the whole thing. Um, if there are children listening, you might want to give them the earmuff situation for just a minute, um, because uh, the quote is uh, full-throated. It's an actual quote from an actual farmer, and I will say they were not totally wrong, partially wrong, mostly wrong, but not totally. So before you accept my recommendations, listen to this farmer who says, no offense, but some of these researchers and all this science bullshit, these people are in science fair labs. They're doing cute little projects. They've never spent their own money. They don't know how to do it. They would just do research to get grant money. And it's all, I totally think it's bullshit. Now, again, I don't think that's the case, but uh, recognizing that I am not an aquaculture producer, right? My money is not on the table here. Uh, I think that the things that are most important as we gather all this information is the financing issues, right? Um, it's really hard for farmers to want to expand. Uh, so, uh, you know, and I, I, as a CR employee, of course, I'm not supporting any specific policies or something like that, but, but if you want to expand the market and want to improve producers' ability to expand, financing is a big barrier. Support systems are another big barrier. Insurance, uh, funding more extension. Uh, I definitely support that. that um, you know, we have this great group in GLAC. In fact, I think I have a graph here. But if you look at this work that uh, Amy Schambach and Kwame McCregory and I just got accepted yesterday, um, there's very little aquaculture program. So this is uh, this is two columns of uh, bar graphs here, right? And if you look on the left, it's do people offer aquaculture programming? Um, on the right, it's aquaponics. And the very the leftmost column in each of those subgraphs is no. The middle is also no, um, but they're interested in it. And the right is yes. So let's go back and forth, and it's broken out by state here. Look at how few states have much in the way of aquaculture extension programming. This was a different survey we did of ag and natural resources um, uh, extension personnel. So we have some in Indiana, we have some in Michigan, we have uh, some in Nebraska related to aquaponics, some in Ohio, some in Wisconsin, a lot of state with very little, right? And this was just extension, so the Sea Grant stuff is not captured in there, but the point is there's not a lot of extension work going on. There, there could be more funding for that potentially too as part of that uh, support system. But my main conclusion is this, it's not a market that's going to grow by itself. Um, there's a lot of social support for other food markets and um, the farmers at least perceive that this social support is lacking for their market as well. Uh, thank you. That's what I got. If you want to talk, please put it in the chat. And if you want to um, ask me questions later, I think that email address works. You can do that there. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Stuart. That's great. We will take questions at the end. Um, people can continue to add those to the chat. Now we're going to turn it over to Max and Trey, who are going to talk more about um, regulations in aquaculture, consumer demand, and willingness to pay for aquaculture in the Great Lakes. Thanks, Nicole. Well, hey, everybody. Um, so this is going to be fun because basically um, I, I, we both give a lot of lectures and I thought it would be more fun if we just kind of talk through some of the findings in the kind of structure of, of uh, something else I've been working on. Um, so just to let me see if I can share. So Trey and I were working on our presentation and then Trey texted me half an hour ago saying he was making some edits to it, so. Yeah, I, I I kind of know what's coming, but not a hundred percent. Okay, can you all see my uh, screen here? Yes, we can. Okay, cool. All right, so what y'all asked us to do was talk about our research, um, and I think um, Stuart did a really good job at the end of that talk, especially mentioning how critical stakeholders can be about whether or not this research has any relevance to the world. Um, and so what I wanted to do was kind of take what I've been working on uh, with respect to entrepreneurship and structure our talk more like a conversation about entrepreneurship in the fish business and aquaculture space. Um, so 
what our research objectives have been historically, um, at least on this project, is to identify and investigate policy related challenges and opportunities, analyze consumer willingness to pay for aquaculture product types and qualities, uh, and then conduct price analysis of aquaculture products from the Great Lakes. Hey, if I can stop you for one second. Um, yeah. How do I do put, that? Can you put your um, presentation in full screen mode rather than presenter oh, yeah. mode? Thanks. How do I? How do I do that? Display settings. Yeah. Duplicate slideshow. No, I think maybe or swap. Does that work? The slideshow might work. Can you see it now? Yeah, we're good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so, I mean, the gist here is is that um, what we're trying to do is to conduct some type of consumer price analysis on aquaculture, and all of this sounds like like uh, like really meaningful research objectives. Uh, it's not abundantly clear that these research objectives um, exactly tie in to exactly what I think an entrepreneur would be looking for if they were to ask a marketing researcher, for example, what their what the, what their needs are. Um, if you want to like a quick hit on what we've been working on. We published a choices article that, uh, uh, that Max and I co-edited last uh, in, in the fall, I believe, um, on the economics of United States aquaculture. And Stuart did a great job emphasizing some of these kind of quick hit um, components. Uh, growth of sales has increased. Uh, you know, we've seen this increase in total demand between all these things. Um, most consumers rank safety as the most important attribute. I think Simone is on this call. Uh, she's got a really great paper in there about that. Um, and then, you know, the, there's a bunch of work on re research and everything else. But what I want to talk about is this concept of long tails. Um, <laughs> and Max hasn't seen any of this. Uh, so, so this is gonna, this is gonna come out of nowhere for Max as well. Um, if you want to be an entrepreneur in general, uh, your first job is to find market niches. Now, it's helpful to some extent to, to know all of the things that everybody kind of talks about, like the, the trade deficit in aquaculture, um, the, the extent of the market in uh, the Great Lakes region versus here in the South. Um, it's, it's, I think, informative to understand exactly what's going on there. Uh, but at the end of the day, how does that form a decision for a stakeholder? Um, and I, I'm not sure all the time that that that, that maybe my work has been effective enough in conveying why all of this research that we're doing has some type of a value add. So once upon a time, everybody wanted a standardized product. And I think that that's where we are in a lot of aquaculture production today. Um, once upon a time, there was this, this push toward standardized potatoes for McDonald's. Uh, you know, you used to have all these different cultivars for McDonald's French fries. Uh, but but you didn't necessarily have <laughs> you had different cultivars and you didn't have a standardized product. Now I can go to a McDonald's no matter where I am and I can eat the same McDonald's French fry. Um, that's honestly like a, a crazy innovation in the history of the world. Um, think about Red Delicious apples. They're probably my least favorite tasting apple. Um, at least the texture is something that like when we think about Honeycrisp is just so much better. Uh, but by and large, people were with that red delicious apple because it wasn't that long ago that you couldn't get an apple in rural Kansas in the winter. Uh, now you can do that all the time. Beer is probably my favorite example. We have, you know, 9,000 craft breweries in the United States today. Once upon a time, we had about 9,000 breweries, but it was because there was no infrastructure to be able to move the product. So when it comes to fish, I think our standard belief system is that people want this standardized fish product the filet of fish or whatever. Well, production booms have followed that demand, right? So U.S. beer production in the United States, and I think this is just a really good example, U.S. beer production has just boomed in the U.S. from 1860 to about 2000, 1990. Notice it's tailing off. Um, but the state of Arkansas, where I now live, has never produced a million barrels of beer. The reason I bring that up is I think that the state of Arkansas beer can maybe say something relevant to Great Lakes aquaculture production. Because historically, it's not like Great Lakes aquaculture production saw this massive boom. Even still, I think there are plenty of market opportunities in Great Lakes aquaculture. So the theory of the long tail is that this idea that our culture and economy are increasingly shifting away from a focus on relatively small numbers 
numbers of hits um, so that mainstream product at the head of the demand curve and moving toward a huge number of niches in the tail. So we are now in a world where there are over 45,000 different options in a grocery store to purchase. Uh, that's up from about 8,000, 7,500 options in the 70s. We've seen an explosion in the number of options. Think about if you try to go buy anything at a Walmart, <laughs> um, you're going to see as many options as they can possibly fit on the shelf. Now, the reason I bring up Walmart is because they have limited shelf capacity. The internet has no limited shelf capacity. I can order, if you've ever heard of Gold Belly, I can literally order um, Buddy's Deep Dish Detroit style pizza here in Arkansas, and I can get it in about a day and a half, maybe a day. Uh, the, the internet has created these opportunities for long tail niche products. Okay, so in the beer market, you can think about it this way. So in popularity, you have Bud Light, Budweiser, and Yingling. Those are kind of those, those top high popularity products. Um, as we move down that curve, though, there are tons and tons and tons of opportunities, right? So Sam Adams is one of those larger craft breweries that exist. Um, as we move further into that niche content, I put in a couple Arkansas breweries just because I think that that really <laughs> emphasizes places that you've never heard of, but still make money. Um, one of those is Prairie, that's in Tulsa. Uh, we get down to Ivory Bill Brewing in the, in the very long tail. That is a very, very, very small brewery in a very, very rural town in Arkansas. And they're still revenue positive. So total beer production in the entire state of Arkansas for 2021 was 51,000 barrels total. Um, just in context, yeah which is uh, a, a kind of a, a standard like cult classic favorite beer is a two million barrel company. So in the entire state of Arkansas, even though we have all these different market opportunities, looking at the total production of, of any brewery is really not telling you what you need to know about how to create that, that potential market growth. So why is this happening? And this is where I think our research is, is extremely relevant for aquaculture in the Great Lakes region. The first thing is that there has been this democratization of the tools of production. It is much easier now to produce things that in a niche level than almost ever before. Um, with that democratized tool of production, you get more stuff. Uh, more people are able to step into that role. Um, you know, think about like tool makers, producers. If we're talking about online digital content, digital cameras, uh, blogging, et cetera, you just have more content everywhere. One example that's probably the most famous example in agriculture is tractors. Um, so once upon a time, you had thousands and thousands of horses in the United States. This is a, an AER paper that I think is just absolutely brilliant. Uh, the, the blue line here is the number of tractors in the United States. And the red line there is the number of horses and mules over time. And look how almost perfectly negatively correlated those two lines are. As soon as the, the tractor took off, uh, the, the Fordson was about 1920. Uh, as soon as the Fordson tractor came out, you can see exactly where that number of horses and mules has declined precipitously. So that's really a lot of the story of agriculture. In, we can look at it in, in terms of technology growth. So the, uh, this is from kind of a polemical article in, in uh, the New York Times, an op-ed piece. Um, where they're looking at the number of acres harvested in corn um, in 1980 or 1950 versus 2015 and a few other ways, it would take another 228 million acres of corn for us to raise the amount of corn that we raise today if we were using 1950s technology. The technological innovation has created a lot of impressive changes in democratized tools for production. I mean, if I need to produce something, I can look at YouTube. Um, there are literally so many extension programs out there and outreach programs that are trying to create opportunities for small food businesses. Um, the food corridor coordinates uh, restaurants, uh, ghost kitchens across the country. Uh, down here in Arkansas, we have the Center for Arkansas Farm and Food and the Arkansas Food Innovation Center. In Michigan, they have the Product Center. Um, all of these things exist to try to democratize the tools of production. Um, Steve Case just published a book on, on this as it relates to entrepreneurship in the, he calls it the rest because it's not on the coast. Uh, Steve Case is really famous. He founded AOL. 
Um, and, and the whole point is that we now have these opportunities that we never had before in the middle of the country and in rural places. Ag plan, if anybody's, if you haven't heard of ag plan, you very much should. It's a business planning tool that's run by the University of Minnesota. Um, if, if you are looking to go get a loan, you probably need to think through your business plan because you're going to have to step into that bank and explain everything that you're going to do and how you're going to be able to pay them back. Ag plan is going to be able to help you think through that. They have actually explicitly designed um, fish, uh, fish plan business templates. Super helpful. Okay, so this is what's going on in agriculture and in the rest of the economy. What's going on in aquaculture as it relates to democratized tools of production? I think everybody probably knows. The regulatory state as in aquaculture is just much more extreme than almost anywhere else in agricultural production, at least on proteins. Max, you wanna talk about the paper that we, we published on that? Yeah, yeah, I can. Uh, so uh, let me give you a little bit of background um, about me. Maybe Trey, you want to talk a little bit about where you're coming from too. So uh, I, I'm an economist. I've got a degree in economics from Michigan State University, uh, born and raised in uh, Northern Michigan, Cadillac, Michigan. And now I work in Chicago at Loyola University of Chicago. Uh, so I've done quite a bit of, of work on, on fisheries, but from like the recreational and uh, wild commercial production. And so I stepped into this uh, with that as my background, and um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about these policy related challenges because that was the first thing they got thrown at me is is you know why is the industry seem to be struggling so much? Well, maybe it's the policy atmosphere that it's finding itself in. Uh, but before I dive into that, Trey, maybe you want to. There was a question here about your uh, affiliation. You want to address that? Yeah, sure. Um... For some reason, my chats aren't popping up, but my so I was at Michigan State University for the last five years. Um, I was a, I was a, an ag economist or the Department of Agricultural Food and Resource Economics. Uh, and then I was also an extension economist there. I moved to the University of Arkansas this summer. Um, here, I still focus on somewhat food marketing and ag marketing. Uh, but I also am really leading the charge on a lot of the entrepreneurship related um, work that we do here. Uh, I was actually just recently named uh, the Sustainable Food Systems Fellow for the Farm Foundation. So my work tends to cut across products and focuses more on um, opportunity uh, recognition for small and medium-sized farms and producers. Um, but I, I work mostly post-Farmgate, if that makes sense. Uh, so what happens when it leaves the, you know, that the 86 cents of the dollar that, um, that doesn't go to the farmer or the producer, what, what's happening there and how might producers be able to benefit more from, from capturing some of that, uh, that supply chain logistics and the marketing channels that they use. So when Trey and I stepped into this project, uh, some of the feedback we initially got about the industry is that it, the policy atmosphere isn't very conducive to growing a business, uh, growing your, your farm. And we thought, well, does like we're hearing that, but can we find evidence of that in the data? Can we back that up with data? And so what we did was uh, work with a couple of people who had an algorithm that would crawl through the a code of federal regulations. So all the laws at the federal level, and they also had a book of laws at the state level and just crawl through that and identify laws that could be related to aquaculture, or other protein related uh, uh, businesses, food production businesses. And what this graph is showing is basically the results of, of that research. And the graph is showing that the number of regulations that seem to have a link to aquaculture production is enormously higher than regulations related to other protein production. So, percent share of US direct regulations. So that's talking about regulations right at like the farm, okay? Not like down the chain. There's also regulations associated with down the chain of production, but these are right at the farm. Uh, so initially what we were finding is, yeah, the data backs up what we've been hearing is that it, there's just more laws that you've got to deal with uh, when you're growing fish. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, 
so so there are caveats to this finding right so um there are yeah that, i mean the key here is is to remember that um this is just literally counting the number of what are called regulatory restrictions so basically what's happening is is we use a computer to read the number of times that in the code of federal regulations it says a producer must blank or shall blank or has to blank so you count all of those up and then you use um, these production functions that are in something called an input output table and then you match those things and you know if if there is some type of a bias in the aquaculture count that bias also exists in all of the other counts okay um, and so what we're finding here is that at least in terms of the total number of times that the Code of Federal Regulations says that somebody in the aquaculture supply chain has to do blank, it is just so much more than every other industry. So notice all of the other industries are down there at that 10% level where aquaculture is up there at that 60% level. Um, the, the thing is... <laughs> that obviously we, we're not quantifying the cost of that regulation. There are plenty of other papers out there that try to really dig into what the cost of different types of regulations are. This is literally just looking at the overall volume of regulatory burdens. Um, another thing that I'd like to point out here, and that I think Stuart did a really good job in, in, uh, in their study uh, emphasizing, is that it's not always necessarily the number of regulations. Um, so statistically speaking, if everybody in the aquaculture supply chain was 99.9% .9 compliant, odds are you still have never eaten a perfectly safe fish or a perfectly legal fish, excuse me. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not safe. And it also doesn't necessarily mean that every regulation was enforced. So what oftentimes matters more than the total volume of regulatory burdens is the enforcement mechanism. Um, and if, if you go look at uh, actually what Stuart's stuff talks about how people feel um, about state regulatory authorities versus federal regulatory authorities, sometimes it's, it's not that the federal laws there are more of, but at least the enforcement is more consistent. Um, and so either way, though, what we're finding when we compare to some of these other proteins is when I'm talking about democratized tools of production for aquaculture, it's not unlikely that some of these regulatory hurdles are probably reducing that democratized tool or opportunity for production. Yeah, and this the state versus Fed is another caveat because we we did an analysis. Now we couldn't look at like state level regulations directed or associated with aquaculture, but we could look at them overall across the food industry. And we saw big differences from state to state. I think the next slide actually shows some of that. And and those differences seem to line up pretty closely with just the overall level of economic activity in a state. So the more, uh, uh, the larger the economy in a state, the more regulations you tend to define. So it's not necessarily the case that like regulations are going to be impeding uh, like economic activity. Uh, but but the the first slide that we showed you certainly seemed to line up with um, some of the rhetoric that we've been hearing. Okay, so then the next reason why we've seen this long tail opportunity is this idea for democratized tools of distribution. So you have more access to niches, which flattens the tail. Think about Amazon, eBay, iTunes, Netflix. Um, in the, the food world, you have things like uh, Too Good to Go, which is now a, a startup that's trying to sell um, unsold food, like, uh, like reduced food waste. Market Wagon in Indianapolis. Um, Gold Belly, I already mentioned. Barn to Door is creating opportunities for, for uh, to set up um, online businesses for small food businesses and, and small growers. Um, there are all of these different things that are moving towards this democratized tool of production. Now, this is the one that I wanted to talk about because I think this is something that has a lot of value relative to our research. So there is this also this push toward connecting that supply and demand. So driving business from the, the hits to the niches. Um, now, this is where things get really complicated because when you have 45,000 options on a grocery store shelf, it's really hard to filter through that noise for what you want to find and how you would find it. So there are all of these different ways to try to connect that supply to the demand. Uh, the Great Lakes Fish Finder is, is one that we, we were just hearing about. That's literally trying to do exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, honestly, you know, you can find a bunch of different examples. Market Maker is another one that's really popular, uh, or at least has been developed and promoted by extension. Uh, but even still, Facebook, Twitter, well, not so much Twitter anymore, but um, Snapchat, 
uh, Instagram, all of these things are trying to connect the, the production to some type of a demand system. So what we started looking at is what ways or what, how do people filter? That's, that's maybe the best way to say it. And one thing that we, we've kind of at least heard was that um, import demand to supply chain uh, fraud information, like that, the idea that like, you know what you're getting from a small business or an aquaculture producer in the Great Lakes region versus not really knowing what you're getting if you're buying from, um, from a Chinese producer, for example. Um, and, and in that world, we started looking at opportunities where the place of origin, uh, you know, how people evaluate um, frozen versus fresh, um, the production method. So is it farmed or is it no claim or is it wild caught? Um, and then at different price levels, what's happening as, as people made these choices. Um, and what we were finding is that there are at least four different types of consumers out there. And the way that each of those consumers are willing to connect to their supply is is uh, is probably the most important thing to really be thinking about. Uh, you have price sensitive consumers, which is probably the largest. Um, I mean, those those are the people that really the rest of the filtration devices, like all the labels you can put on it in the world. If it's not the cheapest, then people aren't going to buy it. Um, and those price sensitive consumers really are not super responsive to a lot of the different characteristics that we might be able to place on the fish product. Max, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, let me just add that look, look at the Great Lakes versus the U.S. domestic bars. Okay, so each bar is, is like the additional amount somebody will pay for a product with that characteristic. Okay, so Great Lakes is a characteristic if the fish comes from the Great Lakes versus if it comes from other some other part of the United States. And across the different types of consumers, the local vores, the fish lovers, the salmon lovers, the price sensitive, the those bars are like the exact same height, Great Lakes versus U.S. So as far as a, a typical, as far as the consumer is concerned, regardless of the type of the consumer, if it's a generic fish from the Great Lakes or some other fish, you know, the same fish from a different part of the United States, they don't really care. You know, they're not, they're not going to pay a premium for a Great Lakes fish. So that was something that surprised me is, uh, you know, I've seen a lot about like, uh, selling locally and people are willing to pay a, a, a premium for local goods. And that's kind of true, but maybe the definition of local has to be super narrow. Like it's got to be coming from within, you know, a few dozen miles of, of where they're, they're buying their food. But if it's more regional versus the rest of the country, it's not going to make a big difference. Yeah. And by the way, the, this is, this is data. Um, the paper's not published, so I'm, I'm kind of being a little cagey about it, but it's, it's a, uh, it's data from uh, Great Lakes consumers. Uh, so we only looked at people in the Great Lakes because we really were expecting to find this massive bump in, uh, in kind of willingness to pay for localness. Um, and, you know, honestly, localness is, is such a complicated topic that we could spend hours just talking about what local means to different people. Yeah. Uh, and I've got so many papers on that topic. Well, if you go into the research, there's lots of papers that talk about how people are willing to pay more for local products, but they don't compare it to like other domestic products versus uh, uh, imported products. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. So let's talk about those other papers. Um, so Max, you ran this meta-analysis. You want to talk about it? Yeah. So like I said, there's been a lot of research done on, on consumer demand for aquaculture products. And so our initial thought was rather than kind of reinventing the wheel, uh, we're going to go out and look at what has been done before. So we looked through 20 years of, of research. We found 45 papers related to uh, demand and what people are willing to pay for aquaculture products. And we went through all those papers, um, the, the prices that they had identified and the, and the types of fish that they were um, uh, looking at, where the consumers were coming from, and we basically put all that into a spreadsheet and then went through systematically to understand like what, what is it about a, a certain fish product that leads to a, a given price that you'll see in the market. So that was the idea behind this meta analysis was pulling out all this data from, from uh, 45 papers uh, and it ended up being 600 prices that we, uh, we found. And so this, is, this graph is kind of summarizing the additional amounts that people will pay for these characteristics. And um, yeah, so like, for example, the fresh characteristic, that's relative to frozen. So relative to a frozen fish product, the typical consumer is willing to pay about $4 more for a fresh product versus a frozen product, holding everything else 
constant. And there's the local effect, which is pretty, you know, pretty much in line with the, what we were finding for Great Lakes products. So it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a two to three dollars uh, that people are willing to pay for a local product. And so not much different compared to a domestic product. A lot of the research that's been done is focused on environmental certifications. Like, do people care about how the fish is raised and the environmental certifications that may be tied to it, like that this is a more sustainably raised product? And the answer seems to be yes, they, they do care. It's, it's uh, one of the most valuable characteristics uh, that, that research has been finding. And, and we also uh, looked more closely at whether or not papers um, related to products from the Great Lakes. There hasn't been a lot of research done on consumers and, and farm-raised fish in the Great Lakes. Uh, so ultimately what we did was focused on uh, the types of fish that other researchers had studied that, that tie back into like the types of fish that are grown in the Great Lakes. And I won't go into details about, about the actual willingness to pay amounts that we found other than they, they basically lined up with what we found across all of the studies that we were looking at. So there wasn't anything super unique about Great Lakes fish products that would lead us to different conclusions about Great Lakes consumers versus other types of consumers. Um, oh yeah, I already have that. Okay, so this is, this is what I when, I, when I think about like what's going on here, <laughs> Um, why are we looking at all these different labels? What, what, what's going on? It's because everybody's trying to filter. Everybody has too many options and they get overwhelmed. It's easier to find the red ball in this, in this pile of balls when there's only six balls when there's, than when there's 24. And it's, it's so hard because of fatigue over commitment and complexity that, that you almost can't analyze every choice or every component in a product. It's, it's just, it's too much at this point. There, everybody has a cognitive constraint and, and we're hitting these cognitive constraints when it comes to our marketing strategy. Um, so there has to be these filters. Um, the filter that's the most obvious and the most common that people talk about is going to be price. Now, if you're a large or if you're a large producer, you can compete on economies of scale on price. We all know if you are a small producer, it is going to be difficult for you to be able to match the price of the larger player. Um, so what needs to happen is as we move into that long tail that I was talking about, there needs to be a, an even better filter on how to try to reach those people. So limited shelf space, historically the filtering mechanism. But now we have so many different options that it is so easy for us to cut market niches over and over and over again, whether it's environmental or it's local or whatever it is that we have to figure out how to filter through all of that noise in our marketing strategy so that we can actually reach that customer that wants our product or that could want our product. Okay, so this is a paper that I published a few years ago on choice overload in beer. Um, and basically what I did is I convinced a brewery, uh, or sorry, a, a bar to double their number of beers on tap to see what would happen in the likelihood that somebody would order a beer. And uh, I, I'm not going to like make you understand this map, but basically what this figure is saying is if I double the number of beers, just do nothing else, just double the number of beers, I would see a decrease in the chance that somebody would order a beer. Um, so increasing the number of beers makes it harder for people to choose. Now, the caveat is if I just added a beer advocate score to the menu, so all of a sudden I gave them a score of one to 100, I could eliminate that choice overload problem. So, so any type of filtration in on that bar list or that bar menu is going to eliminate that choice overload problem. It's going to help people make choices cognitively. All right. And so when we think about how we try to reach these people, I think that we assume that viral marketing looks like this. I post my stuff online. I share that with two people. Those two people share that with two people. Those people share that with two people. This is not how it works. Okay. So I, I don't have kids, but I know about this baby shark video or this baby shark song because I was a camp counselor when I was in college. I sang this stupid song at least two times a day for four summers. I know this song. I knew it, but it didn't go viral back then. I couldn't have made it go viral. It wasn't until it's a group called Pink Fong. They are the ones that really stepped in, took this and made that thing go viral. So your goal needs to be share as much content as possible 
and hope and try to find these mavens or these filtering mechanisms that can send your product out to a broader audience. So what does that mean for strategy? Well, this is an example that's a very narrow example, but, but this is exactly what I'm talking about. So I got married last summer. We had seven days to plan the wedding because of COVID and everything else. Um, we got lucky and there was a, a hotel in a very, very, where my family's from a very, very rural part of Oklahoma. Um, they had converted this old broke down hotel into a really beautiful new hotel. Um, they did not know how to get their product on the, on the list. They're, it's a town of 900 people. Um, so the way that you can make them go Oklahoma viral is that you have an event and then you have that event be shared and you try to connect to the places that there are strategic relationships with other people who might be willing to use that service. Uh, so when I had my wedding, I reached out to KOSU and NPR and they did an audio diary about my wedding. Um, and that was, if you want to think about it, that, that audio diary ended up in more um, ears than just about anything they could have done on their own Facebook page. Okay, so, so trying to make those partnerships is how you can really start cutting through some of that noise with these marketing segments. So the punchline here, though, is that you don't have to be for everyone. You need to choose your battles. If you're working with a small production team, you really need to understand exactly where the opportunities are. So the first thing that you do is you need to think about developing a minimum viable product. Uh, this book, The Lean Startup, is really helpful in making you think about that. The goal here is to start, don't try to, like, like everybody's been to that restaurant that has way too many things on their menu. And so then you just have to ask the filter, which is the waiter, uh, what, what is it that's popular here? Because there's no way y'all do tacos as well as you do pizza, as well as you do cheeseburgers. Pick one and tell me which one is the best. Um, you have to find that minimum viable product and then you build from the minimum viable product. Step two is you have to identify the smallest viable market. Okay, so, so don't, don't think that you're gonna end up on the Walmart shelf immediately. The better strategy is maybe to try to identify the, uh, the, the small restaurants that are starting to develop a cult following and sell into those places. Maybe um, start developing relationships with your university personnel that, that are, are hosting events across the state that wanna do kind of buy local campaigns. Maybe Pure Michigan or somebody is, is wanting to do an event and they wanna showcase um, Great Lakes fish production. Um, but you have to identify the smallest viable market that you know personally that you can dominate. Um, and then you take that market and then you leverage into the big next market. Um, these are two really good books. Um, one is more kind of tech, but, but it's, it's, uh, it's very helpful to think about. Okay, so where we're moving from here is really to start looking for these smallest viable markets. Um, so that's probably the next year of the work that I'm doing on aquaculture is really trying to step into understanding, um, you know, if, if it's local, great. But, but if it is local, what, how is it local? Who, who are the people that we're really trying to target in our local marketing campaigns? Um, you know, and, and if people in the Great Lakes don't like Great Lakes labeling, maybe they like a different label. Maybe maybe they want to see something that, that looks a little bit more unique. I, I don't know. Maybe it's about this environmental consciousness. Um, but identifying these smallest viable markets are, are I think, the next stages of, of at least what I'm planning on doing on this project. Uh, so that's that's what we had prepared. Um, most of that Max didn't know we were going to talk about, but um I, I don't know what the time frame is from here, but uh, happy to take any questions or I'm pretty easy to get a hold of too. I think we have some time for questions. Thanks, you two. Um, we do have two questions. Um, I'm just gonna put them out there and whoever wants to answer. Um, so if Stuart, you wanna come on camera as well. Um, the question was, does Sea Grant or Commerce have financing programs for commercial fishers that could be transitioned to aquaculture, like some USDA guaranteed loan programs? Bob, I can't answer that for Department of Commerce, but that's not the type of stuff that Sea Grant has typically done um, in terms of like direct assistance or loan programs. Uh, it's a good question though. Um, that might be something we would look into with the Great Lakes Aquaculture Collaborative to be able to answer that for DOC specifically. Okay, thank you. Um, a second question, in reference to niche markets, are there any research efforts accomplished or underway for the niche aquaculture sector that involves macro or micro algae farming? 
not that I'm aware of, but I think it's a really interesting uh, conversation. Um, there, so we're, we're working on a few things at Arkansas to just talk about how to develop your own tools to understand how to, how to kind of think through your own niches. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think there's, there's uh, every, every place is different. Um, so I, I know I keep talking about beer, but I drink, <laughs> I drink beer and, uh, and moving down to Arkansas, you see this, this wildly disparate culture as it relates to beer, right? So in Little Rock, uh, somebody mentioned Little Rock, I'm in Fayetteville. Fayetteville has seen a doubling of breweries in the last four years. In Little Rock, their breweries got cut in half. We're in the same state. We have about the same population, but the demand for the same product is completely different in those two towns. Um, and so when it, when it comes to trying to think through your own business strategy, it's really important to know thyself and know thy consumer specifically, intimately, as well as possible. Uh, I mean, a lot of this stuff when it comes to small businesses is relationship marketing. And if you don't understand who you're in the relationship with, you're going to end up in a really rocky divorce. Um, and so I, I would love to, to talk more about that. Um, but I would also love to try to work on developing some of that, uh, some of the toolkit for you to be able to, to, to ultimately evaluate over and over and over again where that consumer marketing strategy works so you can update what i said was what i mentioned the minimum viable product strategy that's exactly what i'm talking about you try a product and then you see how it goes do some survey work and then try something different and then see how it goes and just keep running that circle okay well, we are about to wrap up i'd like to give our presenters the opportunity for any final thoughts um, before we close out, and then we will end the webinar. Thank you, everybody. I don't have any concluding thoughts other than this has been great work, and uh, it's always inspiring to work with farmers, frankly, fish farmers or, or crop farmers. A uh, really resilient, interesting group of people. And Benjamin Belcolm, who I don't know, uh, wants to add some helpful links, and he asked if that's okay. I think the answer is yes. We love helpful links. Uh, the more helpful, the better. Um, so speaking for Nicole there, that's my closing <laughs> thought. The more help, the better. All right, Trey or Max, anything to close us out? No, not not for me. Thank you very much. We we covered a lot of papers. Um, I know it didn't really feel like that, but um, if you have any questions about the specific papers or like we mentioned something, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, I think we've, Max, how many papers have we published on this? Yeah, Eight. yeah, something. Um, so, yeah. so I mean, it's a lot of content, <laughs> and it's specific to different things. So, feel free to reach out if you have any like specific econ questions that you'd like to see what we did. All right. Well, with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thanks to Stuart, Max, and Trey, and we will see you next time. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.